running commuter trains sound quite simple. Going between local towns with passengers heading to work, or just helping people get around the area. Occasionally, commuter trains, and passenger trains in general, share tracks with freight trains, whether they were small locals serving businesses, or big, slow, mainline freights going from one major yard to another, sometimes traveling from state to state. Of course, procedures exist to prevent these trains from bumping into each other, and train crews are given orders letting them know about other traffic. Plus, you had signals, of course, to let crews know if the track's clear, and sidings and multi-track mains for trains to wait or pass one another. Nowadays, it's much easier to space apart trains with modern computers and safety systems, but back then, it wasn't so easy. And if a crew didn't follow those orders and procedures, disaster would occur. Especially one incident in July of 1940, when a self-propelled passenger car collided head-on with a mainline freight train. This would be known as the Doodlebug Disaster. Let's rewind the clock nearly a hundred years ago. Branch line passenger service had become a serious financial issue for all railroads in the early 1900s. The Pennsylvania Railroad was no exception to this. Long before the invention of cars and buses, the Pennsylvania Railroad began experimenting with self-propelled cars, which could operate by themselves without a separate locomotive and without a full crew. Plus, with a cab on each end, turnarounds would be twice as easy without the need of a turntable or Y-track to turn the locomotives around. Plus, since passenger trains on some branches were rather low, it was inefficient to run a locomotive with a small set of coaches when they were barely full. After nearly 20 years of experimentation with various trolley lookalikes, the Pennsylvania Railroad finally turns its attention to the gasoline rail car, or doodlebug, which was a universal term on American railroads for these kind of rail cars that carried passengers along with their own prime mover. From the late 1920s to the 1930s, the Pennsylvania Railroad purchased a series of these self-propelled gas electric cars built by various companies, such as Electromotive Corporation, which later became Electromotive Diesel, or EMD for short, and the Philadelphian manufacturer J.G. Brill, the same company that made the famous bullet cars for the Philadelphian Western. Most of the time the cars would run by themselves, but on occasion later on into the 1940s and 1950s, they would tow P-54 trailer cars, which had built-in coal stoves to provide heat since the doodlebugs couldn't provide steam heat like the steam locomotives could. Similar cars would be built for the electrified portions of the Pennsylvania Railroad in the Northeast during the 1930s, namely the MP-54s. The only difference was they were powered by overhead wires instead of gas. However, one accident would change the history of the doodlebugs and future self-propelled cars forever. On July 31st, 1940, Pennsylvania Railroad Doodlebug 4648 was traveling from Hudson, Ohio, south to Akron on the Cleveland Division on its usual 25-mile commuter run on a warm summer evening with 46 people aboard, stopping at stations like Cayuga Falls, Stowe, and Kent on the way. The car in question was a 1928 build from Pullman and Electromotive Corporation classed as a GEW-275A, the G standing for Gas Electric Prime Mover, the E standing for Electric Drivetrain, the W for the two Westinghouse traction motors, 275 for the horsepower rating, and the A denoting the series letter. 49-year-old Thomas L. Murtaugh was the engineer, and 57-year-old H.B. Schaefer was the conductor. 24-year-old Todd Wan was the brakeman. At the same time, a mixed freight train was heading north from Columbus to Cleveland. It departed Arlington Station in Akron around the same time the 4648 left Hudson and was traveling around 35 miles per hour. The train was led by a pair of I-1SA Class 210 decapods numbered 4454 and 4533. 
pulling around 74 cars. Nicknamed hippos due to their huge boilers, they were known to be slow but having a lot of pull with a tractive effort of 102,027 pounds by force. O.M. Lodge was the chief engineer of the doubleheader freight with B.E. Reynolds as his fireman. Now the doodlebug was scheduled to pull into a siding at Silver Lake to allow the freight train to pass through the opposite way on the single track section at that point. However, for some reason, the bug proceeded past the siding without stopping and was heading straight into the path of the freight train. The conductor of the freight train, Ari Collier, had a written order notifying him that the doodlebug was taking the siding at switch 3. Little did he know the doodlebug was heading straight towards him at 40 miles an hour. When both trains finally caught sight of one another nearby Front Street Railroad Crossing, they both sounded their horns and whistles in alarm and hit their brakes, but there was no time to prevent a disaster. The trains collide head-on at 6 p.m. at a combined speed of 55 miles an hour. The lead decapod pushed the doodlebug 300 feet northward down the track and telescoped 12 feet into the doodlebug, instantly penetrating its 350-gallon fuel tank, spraying the interior of the coach with burning gasoline. All three crew members of the doodlebug bailed out of the car just before impact and survived but were severely injured. Todd Wan, the brakeman, suffered a cut on his head and torn ligaments in his ankle. Conductor Schaefer suffered severe injuries on his right foot and hand, which were later amputated at the hospital. Engineer Murtaugh received similar injuries and was treated for a possible skull fracture. They would be the only survivors of the doodlebug. 43 passengers perished inside the doodlebug. Nine from the impact, while the rest burned alive in the inferno. Residents from the nearby homes and businesses came running to help, but they couldn't get within 20 feet of the wreckage because of the flames and smoke. There was very little they could do at the crash site. The impact of the collision threw the passengers and seats into the front of the car. People and debris piled on top of one another, making it impossible for anyone to escape. W.J. Payne, a 45-year-old salesman, had originally stopped his car at the nearby crossing to wait for the freight train to pass. When the collision occurred, a piece of debris from the colliding train smashed right through his car, injuring his knee. Ambulances gathered at the scene from neighboring communities within an hour, along with a vast fleet of cars. But with the exception of the Doodlebug crew and Payne, there was no one else to take to the hospital. The ambulances were used instead to take the charred bodies to funeral homes. Engineer Lodge of the freight train described the collision, saying, We had just come around the bend when I saw the doodlebug loom up in front of us. We jammed the brakes. When we hit, there was a terrific explosion. The fireman and I stayed with her through the fire and explosion until she came to a stop. Then we jumped through a wall of fire. L.P. Seller, the fire chief of Cayuga Falls, arrived at the scene two minutes after the collision. Flames shot high out of the windows, darting high in the air. The fire was like a screen. It was almost impossible to see what it was like inside the car. Then, for just a second, the wind parted the flames, and I caught a glimpse of the interior. I was sure everybody in there was dead. They must have all died almost instantly. I heard no screams at all. Some of the victims were hanging partially out of the windows, and they were on fire. The freight train couldn't seem to stop, and it kept pushing back the doodle. Some of the burning bodies fell out the windows and were strung along the right-of-way. They were all shattered and bleeding and burnt. We couldn't do anything at first. Everything was so hot it was almost impossible to get near the car. We finally played three lines of water on the fire for 20 minutes before we could get inside the coach. When fire crews finally entered the coach, 
It looked as if a tornado had hit it. All the seats were torn loose from their bases and were piled in a heap in the front part of the car. The same thing happened to most of the passengers. They were jammed to the ceiling at the front end. Rescuers had to use acetylene torches to free some of the bodies. Most of them were so charred they couldn't be recognized. Eventually, the freight train was pushed to a nearby siding, the remains of the doodlebug onto another, so that investigators from the Interstate Commerce Commission could start their investigation into what had happened. Charles Howard, the Pennsylvania Railroad's chief clerk at Cleveland, said the doodlebug had been ordered to take the siding at Switch 3 at Silver Lake, just north of the Cayuga Falls station. The engineer of the doodlebug stated he remembered receiving those orders at Hudson, but he was unable to recall passing the siding. In reality, he had already passed the switch by more than a quarter of a mile until impact. So how could he have missed it? The ICC investigation considered the possibility that the engineer could have been, quote unquote, under the influence of carbon monoxide poisoning with a resultant temporary impairment of mental faculties, but not be wholly unconscious, which would explain his behavior. Carbon monoxide, or CO for short, is an odorless, invisible gas that is produced any time a fossil fuel is burned, namely gasoline. It is a very dangerous compound of carbon and oxygen that can cause headaches, weakness, dizziness, nausea, shortness of breath, vomiting, blurred vision, loss of consciousness, or even death if inhaled in enough amounts. The engineer did complain about fumes in the cab on previous occasions, which was a slight design fault in the doodlebugs at the time. So it is likely the gas fumes from the doodlebugs prime mover must have clouded the engineer's judgment, and he simply didn't realize he had overrun the siding until he came across the freight train. As a result, no charges were held against him. Had the doodlebug contained a diesel-powered prime mover instead of a gasoline one, the fire risk could have been much lower, as gasoline has a lower flash point and higher vapor density compared to diesel. So gasoline is much easier to ignite than diesel, as diesel has a flash point greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit compared to gasoline, which has a flash point of negative 45 degrees. Thus, the gasoline is considered as flammable, while diesel is considered as combustible. Gasoline's low flash point is why it works so well in powering engines like in cars. Flammable liquids can easily be ignited with a simple spark, while combustible fuels like diesel need heat from compression to ignite, according to BP. Also, diesel fuel emits less carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide than gasoline, but it also emits more fine particles, which can cause breathing issues if you inhale enough of it, especially around people with asthma, but either way, it is a much safer fuel. The only problem is it is more expensive to work with, hence why automobiles mainly use gasoline, while heavier vehicles like trucks and locomotives use diesel instead. In the end, what little remained of Doodlebug 4648 was sent to be scrapped, while the two I-1s were sent for minor repairs and returned to service. Sadly, both of them were retired and cut up sometime after 1957 when the Pennsylvania Railroad ended steam service, but one I-1, numbered 4483, was spared from the scrapper's torch and currently sits in Hamburg, New York on Buffalo Southern Railroad's property. There are hopes to move it to the Heritage Discovery Center in Buffalo, New York, where the engine will sit on public display protected from the elements. As a result of this accident, the remaining doodlebugs the Pennsylvania Railroad had were sent to be refitted with diesel engines to greatly reduce the risk of fire between 1940 and 1943. In their classification numbers, they had the G's changed to O's to denote the changes, such as OEG 415 instead of GEG 415, with O meaning oil, which was another word for diesel. 
all future self-propelled rail cars, such as the famous Bud RDCs that would come years later, would also contain diesel-powered prime movers. Three Pennsylvania Railroad doodlebugs survive today, with two in operational condition. 4662, a 1928 OEG 350 built by J.G. Brill, operates on occasion on the Wilmington and Western Railroad in Wilmington, Delaware. It earned the nickname The Paul Revere on June 7, 1990, as a company called Revere Copper and Brass gave a huge grant of money to restore the locomotive at the time, and the name was given in honor of the company. 4666, another J.G. Brill car from 1930, classed as an OEG 415, currently resides at the Allentown and Auburn Railroad in Topton, Pennsylvania, and as of late 2020, is getting its roof replaced. 4668, yet another J.G. Brill build from 1930, classed as an OEG 415, was sold and stored at the Illinois Railroad Museum in Union, Illinois, and was later sold to Clint Jones. None of the EMC-built cars similar to 4648 unfortunately survived. The Pennsylvania Railroad killed commuter service on the Cleveland Division in 1959, with an abandonment beginning decades later when Conrail ended service on the branch. CSX had considered rehabilitating part of the branch and using it as a second main line between Arlington Street and Cayuga Falls. You can see this General Electric C30-7 No. 7001 testing the track bed near the dead Pennsylvania Railroad position signal, but sadly plans fell through and the rails were abandoned for good. Most of the rails were pulled up, leaving some of the track in place between Cayuga Falls and Hudson having been rail banked by Akron Metro but those rails have been dormant for several years. Akron Metro in early 2011 began studying the freight potential of the branch, but nothing has showed up. Today, very little remains of the rails and the crossing the accident took place by. However, in 2005, a memorial monument was erected near the site of the disaster on its 65th anniversary. The memorial was a result of a school project by three 13-year-olds at Sill Middle School, which led a fundraising campaign to establish a permanent memorial to those killed in the disaster. Now it has been 81 years since the accident, and while very little remains of the crossing the accident took place on, the memories of the terrible tragedy will never disappear.